Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Fabrizio Conti, lecturer in history at John Cabot University, and I welcome you all to the third lecture in the John Cabot University Humanism and Beyond lecture series today. Uh, this lecture series is organized by Professor Stefan Sorgner and by me, uh, with the scope to develop a fuller understanding of the concept of humanism and even the role of the humanities, especially considering the most recent developments that aim at reinterpreting and even transcending the concept of humanism on the basis of the most recent philosophical approaches related to transhumanism, critical posthumanism, metahumanism, and so forth. So far, this lecture series has been a fruitful and engaging intellectual enterprise. Be beginning in 2020, we had uh, the first lecture of the series titled The Classical Roots of Beliefs in Witchcraft by myself, a second lecture titled Leibniz Teleology or a Prehistory of Cybernetics by JCU Professor Brunella Antomarini. And today, we will have a lecture or rather a discussion of the book that Professor Sorgner uh, has just published um, this year, titled We Have Always Been Cyborgs, Digital Data, Gene Technologies and an Ethics of Transhumanism, published by uh, the Bristol University Press. Now I will give a, a brief introduction uh, of uh, Stefan Sorgner, Professor Sorgner, and uh, Professor Maurizio Balistrieri, who is also here, um, taking part in this uh, debate with us. Uh, Stefan Lorenz Organer is chair of the Department of History and Humanities and a philosophy professor at John Cabot University here in Rome. And is director and co-founder of the Beyond Humanism Network, fellow at the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technology, Technologies, research fellow at the IWA Institute for the Humanities at IWA Women's University in Seoul, and visiting fellow at the Ethics Center of the Friedrich Schiller University, Indiana. He's the editor of more than 10 essay collections and author of the following monographs. There are uh, too many probably to um, mention them all, but these are Metaphysics Without Truth, uh, Menschen durch the Nach Nietzsche, Transhumanismus, Schöner Neue Mensch, Ubermensch, On Transhumanism, and so forth. In addition, he is an editor in chief and founding editor of the journal Posthuman Studies, a double blind peer review journal published by Penn State University Press. Uh, furthermore, he is uh, in great demand as a speaker in all parts of the world, from the World Humanities Forum to the Global Solutions Taipei Workshop uh, to the Biennale of Arte in Venezia, TEDx. And he is also a regular contact person of national and international journalists and media representatives for, an, uh, for a um, high number of journals, Decide, Cicero, Standard, Sole 24 Ore, and so forth. Professor Maurizio Balistrieri is senior assistant professor in moral philosophy at the Department of Philosophy and Educational Sciences at the University of Turin. His main research interests include robo-ethics, artificial intelligence, bioethics, meta-ethics, normative ethics, assisted reproductive technologies. Among his latest publications, we have The Best Child, Genome Editing and Parental Responsibility, Biotechnologies and Modified Organisms, Sex Robot, Love in the Age of Machines, The Future of Human Reproduction, Human Cloning Before Dolly, and superhumans, ethics, and enhancement. Well, we now uh, look forward uh, to the discussion, to the presentation, to the lecture uh, of Professor uh, Stefan Sorgner and to the uh, discussion uh, that Professor Sorgner will have with uh, Professor uh, Balistrieri. So uh, I would say that uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Many thanks, um, Fabrizio, Professor Conti, for that kind introduction. Yes, we've organized, I mean, we are organizing that lecture series together to realize some reflections on the various approaches to humanism and beyond. Um, and we, we, we deal with a great variety of approaches to uh, understandings of humanism, from an ancient understanding over medieval 
over the understandings of humanism in, in modern times. And so it is supposed to provide a better understanding where we come from, where we go to. And yeah, I'm, I'm very happy today is sort of my turn in order to present some reflections on these issues, which we've been dealing with for, for quite some time now. And yes, um, today I will, I will present my the reflections of the book, which actually has been released in print today. Um, so today is actually the publication date of my, my new book, We Have Always Been, been Cyborgs. And I'm very happy that uh, Maurizio, Professor Balistrieri has agreed to, to respond, to discuss with me the issues um, which, in which we're both extremely interested in, which we've had many discussions sort of in, in a great variety of settings before. And, and, and I'm sure we will have many further discussions in the future because basically um, with all the changing events, with all the new emerging technologies which do get developed, further, there's a further need of reflecting on additional issues and new philosophical challenges will, will arise which, which need, need to be dealt with and, and need to be covered. So, yes, today um, I will be presenting some parts of, my, of, of the book We've Always Been Cyborgs. And I will, I will, I will do so right now. And, and for that purpose, I will also sort of remove... Um, um, you uh, sort of Fabrizio and Maurizio from the screen, and then then we'll get you back once um, directly after the lecture. So we've always been cyborgs, and today I wish to stress um, that there is that we need to have a develop a democratic usage of our digital data. And this democratic usage of our digital data is a pragmatic mustard. Smartwatches, the Internet of Things, and a permanently increasing amount of autonomous cars are nowadays an integral part of our life world. It would be naive to assume that here with these developments have come to an end. About six million years ago, the last common ancestors of human beings and great apes existed. The commercial use of the Internet was established less than 30 years ago. We need to acknowledge that the digital age is still in its embryonic state and has already had significant effects upon our lifestyles all around the world. Digitalization processes also alter the potentials of other emerging technologies, among which the great variety of gene technologies is particularly noteworthy. The gene scissor CRISPR-Cas9 might even be the most important scientific and technological invention of this decade. Yet without the application of digital technologies to genes, which is being done by big gene data, gene technologies could not realize their full potential. The greatest potential for radically altering our way of life can be found at the intersection of these groundbreaking technologies. All processes of the life world get digitized. Autonomous cars are taking over the streets, blockchain technologies decentralize the internet, um, cryptocurrencies attack the relevance of banks, smart cities get developed. Yet if rumors remained the same, all of these processes could not unfold a significant part of their impact. Smart cities need upgraded humans. Elon Musk, Neuralink, and all the other companies, institutes, and task forces which work on trained computer interfaces will have the most significant impact on the future of human flourishing within the forthcoming decades. Computers are, getting, are in the process of getting smaller and of entering our bodies so that we turn into upgraded humans who can interact efficiently with their environment within smart cities and have the appropriate means for dealing with aging, the worst mass murderer in the world. The development goes along with new challenges related to digitalization, whereby the coming about of the internet panopticon is the most serious of all of them. A social condition arises in which all of our digital traces could be connected with each other and could be under permanent surveillance. From last year onwards, China has embraced such digital possibilities and will associate a social value to each action. Europe, on the other hand, has introduced rather rigid data protection regulations which undermine the possibilities of data collection and the realization by means of establishing correlations between genetic data and health issues. Both political attitudes have an enormous amount of political implications. From a naive point of view, it could be said that China promotes security, while Europe cherishes the norm 
of, of, of freedom, which is a central achievement of the enlightenment process. However, such a simple-minded and simplistic dualistic analysis does not do justice to the multifaceted implications of the new uses of digital technologies. There are a great amount of plausible personal as well as political reasons for digitally collecting data. We have always been cyborgs. So after the shift of information processing from the analog to the digital world of computers, the process of mobilizing these systems has emerged from cumbersome personal computers to much more practical smartphones. However, in order to be able to access digital information even more quickly and easily, and in order to guarantee that an efficient interaction between us and autonomous cars, the Internet of Things and all the other aspects of a smart city can be realized, it is necessary to integrate computers more intimately into our bodies. This is exactly what we're working on intensely. The individual components that currently exist in the smartphone would therefore have to be replaced by new devices. The computer monitors become a smartphone interface, which is now in the process of connecting ever closer to the human optic nerves. Digital classes, such as the Google classes, which are no longer produced, are only a transitional medium in this respect and will be increasingly integrated into people. Actually, Google has just released about two months ago uh, a new Google class, actually in cooperation uh, with, with Ray-Ban, and they are made available for only like 300, 350 euros. But they also developed... Um, they also developed contact lenses that are able to measure the glucose value of the eye's tear flute. Diabetics have to check this daily, which is usually done by taking blood samples through injections. The implantation of lenses in the eye and the subsequent immediate stimulation of the optic nerves could be the obvious next steps in the developments. If there's no user interface left, it makes sense to also integrate the chip into the body. At present, the outside of the hand between the thumb and the index finger is widely used for having a chip. A Swedish company already offers its employees such a chip for this purpose. It's obvious that the system will be used as a versatile key replacement in the not too distant future for hotel rooms, for opening, starting cars, turning on smartphones. However, the possibilities of such a chip go far beyond this simple use since it's already in principle an equivalent computer replacement today and without an additional external device, the control of such a chip must also be revolutionized. Just as the mouse and keyboard have been replaced by wiping and speech technology, new controller elements are required for an implanted computer. As early as 2016, a student of mine used to control wristband Mayo for an in-class presentation, which is connected to the computer via Bluetooth and enables the wearer to control a PowerPoint presentation by means of gestures. Gesture control system radically changed the choreography of man-machine interaction. So it was possible to simply wipe in the air and then by, via Bluetooth, the PowerPoint moved from one slide to the next. The system integrated into the body could also be operated in this way, so that no more wiping over device surfaces and no external miles is required. Neither an analog nor a digital keyboard will be necessary for text input either. Voice commands can already be employed. Meanwhile, however, intensive work is being done to avoid such commands by trying to translate thoughts directly into digital information. This means that only thoughts will be necessary to compile a text um, by means of a brain computer interface. And team led by Professor Tanya Schultz from the University of Bremen was responsible for fundamental research in that field. In the meantime, Facebook has taken up this idea, employs a team of 60 people to put this knowledge into practice. The future of typing is thinking. I mean, Facebook now paying 60 highly trained engineers, computer scientists work on that um, project. And, and, and so they must be, it's highly promising. That costs a lot of money. So it is very likely that this will be realized in, in, in the near um, no, or not too distant future, that all your thoughts will directly, all the dreams will directly um, can be live streamed on, on Facebook. The personal computer turned into a smartphone, which will get reduced to the size of a small chip by means of which our bodies get upgraded towards their transhuman existence. Is this a categorically new development? 
Are we going beyond our previous humanity here? Are we becoming cyborgs now or only now? Is It is central to the assessment of these new technologies that we've always been cyborgs. The word cyborg means cybernetic organism, whereby cybernetic comes from the ancient Greek kubernetes, which means helmsman. It's the steersperson of a ship. Cyborgs are therefore controlled organisms. Control already happens with us becoming human. In philosophy, human beings were usually defined by their ability to speak. Learning language is our first upgrade, which our parents provide us with. Our cyberization continues with the acquisition of new skills, such as learning mathematics, history, and so on. However, a new dynamic is currently emerging. Control is being exponentiated, for example, through genome editing, gene modifications, CRISPR and brain-computer interfaces in particular. Ever smaller chips are migrating into our bodies where they form interfaces with nerve cells or organs in order to collect valuable information about our bodies using sensors. These te technical developments continue a process that began with our first upgrade in language development. With the integration of digital technologies into our humanity, new possibilities as well as serious challenges arise. And both aspects are related to the issue of total surveillance, of the collection of all our digital data. And this is, this is sort of the, the challenging issue with which we need to be confronted. I think this is the most challenging issue um, when it comes to digitalization. And please feel free to ask me questions and and uh, during during the presentation and during Maurizio's presentation, please use the chat box in uh, next to YouTube, and then the moderator will read the question and will ask the, the ask the question after um, it's been um, after our two presentations. So, what about what about the collection digital of digital data? We've got a personal interest in data, digital data collection. The process has enormous advantages in many respects. For example, the constant monitoring of one's own body could be decisive for readiness to combat aging-related processes. As soon as the blood sugar level, cholesterol level, or blood pressure seems to change in a problematic way, people could be digitally warned so that the problem can be addressed as soon as it arises, and not only when it's well advanced. Even a predictive maintenance of humans might be possible on the basis of these technologies. Predictive maintenance is already being used in machines. Sensors within a plane can tell us that a specific part of the engine is likely to become dysfunctional within the next six months. We can replace this part so that no risk for human lives in this respect has to occur. With RFID chips entering the human body, radio frequency identification devices, jobs, we can realize the predictive maintenance of human health. Researchers of Tufts University have already developed a tooth-mounted sensor which tracks every bite someone's making. And further such sensors could make up an entire internet of bodily things, which can then interact with the regular internet of things. And that, that sort of the, will be the next development, which has already been initialized. The internet of bodily things, chips wandering into our bodies. The possibilities associated with this type of body monitoring are enormous and are likely to have significant relevance in combating aging-related processes. And here the aspect of human flourishing comes in. Technologies have always increased the likelihood of our flourishing, and human beings have a great variety of associated goals. Yet there are some challenges which are troublesome for most of us, and one of these challenges is the process of aging. Two-thirds of all deaths are related to aging-related processes. The more personalized data we have concerning the correlations between genes and aging, lifestyle choices and well-being, and genes and well-being, the more reliable our data is for biotechnological research and medical in interventions. Hence, it's strongly in our interest, it's strongly in our personal interest that our personalized data enters a big data computer so that such correlations, correlations between genes and the quality of life can be realized and can be collected and analyzed. Based on this research, diseases can be treated, aging can be dealt with, and human flourishing can be promoted. And all of these issues are in the interest of most human beings. This is where the aspect of human flourishing come in. Technologies has always increased the likelihood of fulfilled lives. And humans have a great variety of, of different goals. 
Yet there are some challenges that are problematic for all of us. And, and in particular, the issue of aging is hereby, um, you know, one of the most important ones. And it's not about, it's not just about, you know, um, increasing the lifespan. It's in particular about increasing the health span. We don't just want to stay alive for a longer period of time. We want to stay alive in a healthy manner. And that means we also need to realize it's it's not just about in, you know um, getting closer to the 120 something years, which was the maximum lifespan of a human so far, but we need to realize that other other animals have managed to live much longer, more than 200 years. And it's and by means of by means of altering our genes, it's 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 possible to also think about these possibilities of radically transing, transcending um, the currently given lifespan of increasing the health span of for further 30 years but that also has not only so it's in our political in, in our personal interest but that also has a lot of political implications and there's a lot of political interest in in data collections and the greatest potential for a radical change in our way of life lies at the interaction intersection of digital and genetic technologies. So a central prerequisite for the application of the latest techniques is the availability of data on correlations between genes and diseases and psychological and physiological characteristics, as these are the prerequisites for the application of improving, improving gene techniques, such as genome editing, selection after artificial insemination and pre-implantation diagnostics, as well as bioprinting. So it's the interplay between these two technologies. The relevance of collecting a wide range of personalized digital data goes beyond reasons related to individual flourishing. Collecting digital data is relevant for policymaking, for international as well as national political decisions, as well as for all areas of economic processes. The following examples only provide a brief selection of reasons why not collecting digital data cannot be a realistic option for us. We need to do so. So far, I have not yet mentioned the most important reason for accepting entering further into and embracing this internet panopticon. And the central reason is that we live in a globalized world and data is the new oil, as many experts stress. This needs to be relativized, this statement. Oil is a natural product, while digital data is an intellectual property. Yet the implications can be compared, but data as well as oil, mean power as well as financial flourishing. Given this realization, not collecting digital data cannot be a realistic option. Digital data is a central pillar for economic flourishing. There are other pillars like engineering, natural resources. Still, the use of all the other sectors can only be realized in the best possible manner if data is being taken into consideration in too. And the importance of digital data will continue to increase in the future, as more precise and specialized data becomes available, as more comprehensive data becomes available, countries and institutions which embrace the Internet panopticum have the best possible foundation for realizing an economic flourishing. Google, Facebook and China are the most significant players concerning the collection of digital data so far. In the US, digital data are primarily being collected in big companies. The Chinese solution seems to be even more efficient, as in China, a, a social credit system has been universally applied from last year onwards, which enables the collection of all digital traces. And the amount of digital data which gets collected in this manner can hardly be underestimated. The more digital data becomes available, the more political, scientific, and financial well-being can be realized. Europe, on the other hand, has institutionalized data protection regulations which go against the possibility of a helpful collection of digital data. It had good intentions, but it undermines many of the most fundamental European interests. Digital data for scientific research, political decision-making processes, as well as economic flourishing will not be available, yet they will be needed. Thereby, it can be expected that the consequences for Europe will be devastating ones, as Europe will have to pay China to get hold of the digital data needed for all of these enterprises. China will continue to collect more and more digital data, and consequently, we gain more economic as well as political power. Europe's economy, on the other hand, will not be able to compete with China. And the main reason why the Chinese will continue to visit Europe will be its rich cultural history and its great variety of fascinating culinary experiences like the Colosseum, the Louvre, Neuschwanstein, 
pizza, Kaiserschmarrn, and the Swiss cheese fondue. We will get paid for performing traditional dances for the Chinese and for dressing up in our traditional local clothes, like Roman gladiators performing our dances in front of the Colosseum. Yet there will be no significant interest in us as partners in research or for economic reasons. These implications of us not collecting data will have an enormous relevance for our financial well-being. It will decline significantly. The middle class will be the first interest group which will strongly realize the consequence of these developments. They will not be able to afford the latest cars, have several vacations a year, and be able to work at a well-paid job with a decent university education. We already see the initial traces of that development. And whenever people are worse off they, than they used to be, even relatively speaking, they look for scapegoats. Someone else must be responsible for their social situation. Blame is usually given to members of minority groups, immigrants, or the weak others in general. If this is the case, extremist parties will get elected and the tension within the society will increase. Civil war becomes inevitable. All these reflections make it practically inevitable to be praise the Internet panopticon, the collection of digital data, as we cherish our personal as well as our economic well-being and do not wish to be worse off than our ancestors. Those interests mentioned above are closely linked to and can be promoted intensely by means of the collection of data. And this is a central reason why the collection of digital data is a pragmatic must-have. And so far, I have not yet heard a good reply which renders these reflections implausible or invalid. I'm not pleased about these reflections myself, yet there seems no other way out. I strongly wish to stress that the above analysis is not one about which I am happy. I'm aware that the risks, the dangers for liberal systems are enormous. Any structure of total surveillance could be used against the plurality of human flourishing and in the interest of the ones who have access to the data. And this issue can become particularly critical if a political system has, has a totalitarian structure. There's a risk of the coming about of a totalitarian surveillance society of unprecedented scale, which would be devastating for a great plurality of human flourishing. However, even in the liberal system, such surveillance structures can have extremely problematic implications. There's always an enormous risk connected to the ones who have access to the data and could use the information in their own interest. This is the central challenge with which we are confronted. However, at the same time, it needs to be kept in mind that we don't wish to give up the possibilities connected, um, connected with big data analysis either. Hence, I need to strongly point out we need to embrace the Internet panopticon which goes along with the loss of privacy as, as an as good as it gets solution. And is it problematic? Does it have to have devastating consequences? Or is there the possibility of infirming plurality while we're still being able to use the benefits which goes along with data, big data analysis? The collection of digital data becomes a pragmatic necessity maybe even the development of a European social credit system. There doesn't have to be a conflict between total surveillance and freedoms. And there are strong pragmatic reasons why we need to embrace and accept total surveillance. That means a loss of privacy. And the most challenging issue is who has access to all the available personalized data which gets collected. A challenging pragmatic issue is that this data must be protected well so that hacking it is not a practically realistic option. My suggestion is that the data ought to be processed primarily by algorithms, so that the quantity of humans having the right to access this data is limited. In the end, this issue is a pragmatic one. People trying to get hold of the data, others trying to protect it. My central claim in this reflection is that we urgently need to rethink the meaning of data collection. Instead of data being collected primarily for marketing pur purposes, and it's being done in the US, so that in such a liberal system, as for realizing or for realizing rigid political goals as it's done in China. But we need to develop a European way, a European way to use the data democratically. The data needs to be used in our interest. And by not enabling the possibility of digital data collection in a proper manner, 
we undermine this possibility of using data democratically. So why should the data not be collected by private organizations? Are private institutions not better at solving problems? Are private companies not the ones who embrace and drive innovation? And the central reason why the data must not be collected by private structures is that data is power. It's also political power, not only economic. The more data an institution possesses, the more powerful and also politically influential it gets. If a private company had the right to gather all the data, it would become quasi a strong political player. In addition, it needs to be considered that all different data and um, kinds of data need to be collected. To guarantee that this can be case, political decisions need to be taken so that the possibility of collecting all the data becomes an option. And this not, could not be realized privately. A central step for realizing the collection of all the data would be that we become upgraded humans. That means that chips wander into our bodies. Chipping humans has to become the norm. In Sweden, the option of receiving one's passport as a chip is already given. However, offering the possibility of receiving a chip and making it politically obligatory seem to be two radically different procedures. Making it obligatory to chip humans seems to imply that the government forces a problematic harm on all citizens and visitors, which again seems to undermine the norm of freedom. But this doesn't have to be the case. Let's compare this procedure with, with that of obligatory vaccinations. In both cases, we have a legal obligation whereby the bodily integrity of a person gets challenged. However, in both cases, it can, be, it can only be a legal obligation if the risks associated with the procedure are minimal and social benefits significant. And this is a case. At the moment, this seems to be a radical step. Once the procedure will have become the norm, it can be expected that it will be of no significant concern to us. So let's return to my claim that we need to develop a European way to use data democratically. The financial gain associated with the data collected needs to be in the interest of the people. In the US, it's in the interest of companies. If private companies have all these digital data, they turn into significant political players. Hence, the danger comes up that the foundations of liberal democratic structures get undermined. In China, digital data is being collected by the state. However, the values and norms on which their system is based are incommensurable with the achievements of the Enlightenment. In Europe, we currently reject the use of our digital data by having implemented rigid data protection laws. And this is not in our interest due to the possibilities related to using this data. We need to develop a social democratic alternative, which takes into consideration that the relevance of privacy is related to the fear of sanctions as well as to that of intellectual property. The fear of sanctions needs to be reduced to guarantee the affirmation of a great plurality of concepts of the good life. Hence, we need to embrace a, a radical plurality of concepts of the goods. I mean, we need to increase the concept of negative freedom, of absence of constraint even further, to accommodate an even greater plurality of concepts of the good. Sanctions must only occur when harm is being done, when harm is directly being done to a person. Moral institutional as well as legal sanctions must only occur where proper harm to a person is being done. And this issue needs to be clarified further. That's a, that's a tricky issue, and I'll talk about that further in, in, in the book We've Always Been Cyborgs. But if the government stores all digital data and uses them, then it can be argued that expropriation occurs, taking away the intellectual property related to digital data. And that would be an illegitimate harm being done to personal, or at least it could be argued that this is the case. But this needs to be rethought. It would not be an expropriation of our digital data, of our intellectual property, if the data was used in a democratic way and was used so that it helps to finance our interests. Here, the issue health of health comes in. The majority of citizens identify increased health span with a higher quality of life. And this matters politically. More than 90% identify an increased health span with a higher quality of life, either intrinsically or instrumentally. And that's why this issue matters. This is the reason why a universal a public health insurance is politically justified. Yet the costs for upholding such a system are enormous. Even in Europe, the difference concerning the quality of a public universal health care system are enormous. It already makes a difference when you're in Italy or in Germany. Health care is incredibly expensive. 
gets its in our interest. And if the digital data was used to at least partially cover the costs of a public universal health insurance, it would not be an expropriation, but rather the payment for a service which is widely accepted and widely requested. Because it's identified with an increase of, of the good life. Most people identify an increased health span with an increased quality of life. As having a health insurance is a widely shared human interest, it's a duty of the government to provide people with it. Developing a new drug is risky and costs a lot of money. If a pharmaceutical company has successfully developed a new drug and has patented the inventions, they've got the exclusive right for 20 years to realize a financial gain out of that patent. They can charge whatever amount of money they want for the drug developed. And we just see the implications in the current, in the current pandemic crisis, actually with the patent on, on the vaccines. This makes sense as they took the risk and find the companies took the risk and financial burden to develop the drug in the first place. However, data is needed for developing new drugs. Where do, where do the companies get the data from? In a political regime with a, with a digital surveillance system, the government stores and projects the available personalized data and they can pass the depersonalized versions of the data onto others. That means to, for example, to a drug company. In this way, certain limitations can be imposed on the developing company. The pharmaceutical company can no longer charge whatever is in their interest, as the drug was developed on the basis of data provided by people. The data was made accessible on the basis of a contract with the government which limits the rights of the drug company. In this way, it can be guaranteed that newly developed drugs can be made available to the people at a financially more accessible basis, or in a way that it can be included in a universal public health insurance. So storing and using the data by the government is not, or in this case, doesn't have to be an expropriation. In this case, it would be a payment. We support the payment of a universal public health insurance by means of our personalized data. And this is what I mean by democratizing the use of collecting data. Nevertheless, it can be objected that even though I permanently stress the relevance of the norm of negative freedom, because I think that's one of the, that, that's the most important achievement of the Enlightenment, and the need to promote plurality further, one could wonder whether this doesn't, whether my claim that we all need to embrace total surveillance undermines the re relevance of freedom. It's clear that it does. No society can have absolute freedom. Sanctions for certain behavior are necessary. If someone kills an innocent person, the murderer needs to be punished. Can a certain type of bodily harm become legally obligatory? Sure, vaccinations are the best example. Still, one can wonder whether it would not be in tune with the norm of freedom if a dropping out option existed. That means if it was possible not to be forced to pay for a universal public health insurance by means of, of the collection of digital data. So if citizens prefer to pay for universal health insurance with money rather than with personalized data, should a social liberal democratic society not offer their citizens this option? Negative freedom is a, is a, is a wonderful achievement. Maybe this option should be available. However, what would be the consequences? How much would it cost to pay for the public health insurance with money rather than with depersonalized data or with personalized data? If it doesn't cost much, then many citizens might choose the option, which would undermine the goal of collecting the data in the first place, and the dropping up out option would get more expensive. In this case, if the option dropping out option became more expensive, only very few rich citizens could afford it. Doesn't this undermine the undermine freedom too? If the power difference between the rich and poor gets too big, then the weaker ones under an illegitimate pressure. Hence, freedom undermines itself if one provided citizens with the dropping out option. Even though it initially seems to be more in tune with negative freedom, if a dropping out option was legally provided, given further reflections, it seems more likely that in this case, freedom undermines itself. In any case, further reflection and practical evidence is, are needed for further judgment on this issue. The further and widely shared concern needs to be mentioned too, namely that of discrimination. Does the digital system of, dig of, of, of collection of digital data not promote the discriminatory structures and maybe amplify them even further? But the contrary is the case. The aforementioned very only applies if digitalization gets promoted and a person gets suspicious on the basis of human-made categories. 
It can actually be shown how full monitoring leads to a reduction of, in the violence caused by racial discrimination. People of color often share the experience in the US, also in Europe, where white customers look at them with suspicion in supermarkets. It seems that they are being checked to see if they're stealing goods. One woman of color recently reported her shopping experience in Amazon Go Market that were recently established in some US cities. How she was met was different from traditional supermarkets. She was not viewed with suspicion. In these markets, you have to re-register when you enter, which means that from then on, you're under, under permanent surveillance. Because every single item in this store has an RFID chip, it's linked to your Amazon account when you take it and put it in your pocket. Once you've completed your purchase, you simply have to go and the amount of money from all the products you have put in your pocket will be debited from your bank account. The aforementioned woman of color describes in a, in a newspaper report that no one looked at her with suspicion when she was shopping at an Amazon Go market. It's clear that once you're in a market, you'll be wretched and you will pay for what you take with you. So her shopping experience was not discriminatory. If such a system was generally established, it can even be expected that such changes and that such a change behaviors would become common public practice. So by changing a public practice, you also change widespread stereotypes. And this example as an indication that we have reasons to argue that certain types of racial discrimination can be resolved by total collection of digital data. And many further specific issues could be dealt with. But it was not my intention here to develop a fully worked out political system involving algorithmic data processing. I don't even think anyone answer can ever be fully convincing and appropriate for all systems. I merely wish to show that embracing total digital surveillance and the loss of privacy which goes along with it can be in tune with the affirmation of the norm of negative freedom and that it's in our interest to implement such, such structures. As this seems to be the most promising way of using digital data in a democratic manner, and not in a way that it primarily serves the interest of governments or private companies. In such a way, this would be a European social credit system, which includes the democratic usage of, of our digital data. The comprehensive data collection can also replace existing elements which fulfill the role of a social credit system with more reliable ones, such as a Schufa, which is a German private credit bureau, criminal or police records, official medical ex examinations, which are needed in, in countries for becoming civil servants. So we already have some su such social credit system also in Europe. And this could also result, for example, in, in socially weaker ones becoming credit worthy through data collection. So it, it you don't even have to own any, but it, it this way you could become worthy of a credit by means of, of your actions. In contrast to the Chinese systems, however, it should be based on the norm of freedom. The more intensive the monitoring, the higher the probability of not committing a criminal or morally reprehensible act, but also the probability of sanctions for such actions. However, there are no perfect moral systems. One danger associated with this is an increase in the number of problematic sanctions imposed for morally unacceptable acts. And this is a real reason why we value privacy. In order to guarantee a plurality of lifestyles, we must promote freedom much further than is currently the case and sanction only serious offenses. The state has a central role to play in this and it should create the necessary regulations for the handling of data. If most information is collected by only a few private institutions, such as Google or Apple, it will be more difficult to guarantee the rule of law. Who has access to which data must be restricted? And this insight is central, as human beings have a widely shared tendency of abusing their power, of using information in their own interest, and it's very difficult to undermine this risk. Consequently, it needs to be noted that in a system of total digital surveillance, it ought to be primarily algorithms which have access to the digital data which gets collected. Algorithms must, should primarily be responsible for mon monitoring um, um, the digital data. Only in exceptional circumstances and emergencies should humans have the right to access the data. And it's relevant for the preservation of the free rule of law that primary monitoring is carried out using algorithms and that human access must be strictly regulated since the potential for abuse is undoubtedly enormous. And it actually makes you makes me 
it scares me enormously. But, but the, the advantage is such that we need to embrace the collection of personalized digital data for, for pragmatic reasons. I'm coming to my concluding remarks. So please, or if you've got questions, post them in the chat already. I explained that computers are getting smaller and entering our bodies so that we become upgraded humans who can interact efficiently with the environment in smart cities and have the means to cope with aging, the worst, world's worst mass murderer. And this development is accompanied by new challenges related to digitalization. All these considerations make it practically necessary to promote the comprehensive collection of data, especially big chain data, as we well value both our personal prosperity and our economic prosperity, and do not want to be worse off than our ancestry. If we are to promote our prosperity, we need to address these challenges and make the appropriate policy arrangement. In this way, our average health span can be significantly extended, which further increases the likelihood of human flourishing. Here, I would like to emphasize that full monitoring does not have to mean giving up negative freedom. Total surveillance, the collection of personalized data, is not just a tool for the powerful to increase their power. At least it doesn't have to be the case. There is, of course, the danger that the internet panoply can, can be used in this way which would confront us with a monetary system of, un, of unprecedented intensity. And this scares me enormously. And this is also the main reason why there is such a widespread fear of such structures. And I can understand that. I can strongly emotionally understand that. It's not that the fears are unfounded. One way of dealing with this fear could be to use primarily algorithm for monitoring. And in this case, the likelihood of human abuse is reduced. Psychological studies confirm that people prefer algorithmic to human judgments, which seems to imply that humans are also less afraid of being monitored by algorithms than by other humans. Algorithms can be programmed to take human rights into account or personal rights into account. If humans are primarily responsible for monitoring, the risk of abuse increases. However, and this is another insight highlighted here. Many of our personal interests can be promoted by big data analysis based on personalized long-term monitoring. Personalized data is necessary when it comes to gaining knowledge about the relationship between genes and health, genes and well-being, and lifestyle and human development. Large data collections on all these topics require personalized data. The more data we have, the more correlations can be identified. And even if all the data were available, there would be many more moral challenges. Who would have access to which data? Who collects the data? Which goals can be promoted with the help of this data? Advertising flourishes particularly strongly to, to data collection. Should advertisers also in such a system have the right to buy data from the government? If this is the institution responsible for the collection? At the moment, I assume that it must be the, the state that is responsible for collecting data, because any other organization or institution that has all this information at its disposal would soon be extremely powerful, which would give it enormous political influence. And I have more trust in, in a European government um, than, than in a private, um, in a, any kind of private company. And this brief selection of questions shows how groundbreaking the implementation of such, such structures is. However, we need data for economic well-being, for scientific research, for the promotion of well-being and for the elimination of aging. The achievement of all these objectives is so important that not collecting data is not a pragmatically realistic option. And with the help of a European social credit system based on the recognition of the relevance of negative freedom, we can further promote a wide variety of lifestyles and the health and welfare related interests and that depend on digital data collection. Whoever claims that these reflections are absurd might wish to consider the following statements. A pioneer in aviation, Wilbur Wright said in 1901, I quote, I confess that in 1901, I said to my brother Orwell that man would not fly for 50 years, unquote. The father of radio, Levy Forrest, was still certain in 1926. Quote, so I repeat that while theoretically and technically television may be feasible, yet commercially and financially I consider it an impossibility, a development of which we need not waste little time in dreaming. Unquote. A leading computer expert, Ken Olson, president of Digital Equipment Corp., assumed in 1977, quote, there is no reason for any individual to have a computer in, in his home, unquote. 
these remarks should give us further further food for thought. And I think they make us aware that things can really radically change in, in a very short period of time. So I'm looking forward to hearing your, your question or receiving your questions. Thank you so much, Stefan, uh, for this uh, fascinating uh, lecture. Uh, really, this is really the future, uh, but I think that this is already the present, actually. What you explained, what you talked about, uh, this is so relevant today already, uh, rather than being relevant you know, uh, tomorrow. Um, so I would now uh, give the word to uh, Professor Balistreri, Maurizio, if you want to uh, maybe ask questions or just, you know, uh, give a um, presentation yourself on a topic related to this one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabrizio. Thank you, Stefan. It was uh, really a pleasure to, to listen to your presentation and uh, read your, your book. Highly recommend, uh, recommended. Um, and uh, and my um, I was listening to your um, your presentation and your words, and I was thinking that you are not just describing uh, a great revolution. You are um, approving, and you are saying that uh, it is something uh, good that uh, um, we are developing uh, important uh, new technologies able to um, to promote and uh, to increase the likelihood of uh, uh, transcend uh, the current uh, boundary of uh, boundaries of human existence and uh, uh, increase the likelihood uh, uh, of having uh, a good uh, a good life and um, this is a, an important point that uh, um, you discuss you analyze uh, in the chapter 1 in the the first chapter of your of your book in which you, you describe the transhumanist my my question is how can you combine this uh, uh, idea that uh, we need new technologies in order to um, to promote uh, the, our good life with the idea that we should uh, um, defend and we should uh, um, yeah we should defend uh, a, a plurality of conceptions of the of the good. Uh, in your book, you say that uh, uh, any um, attempt to give uh, an uh, universally valid, non-formal uh, uh, account of the God is bound to fail uh, because we can uh, um, we can always uh, find people uh, saying that uh, their preferences, uh, choices. Uh, uh, don't uh, corres correspond to our idea of uh, uh, of good life, uh, good life, and uh, mm, I agree with uh, um, with this point, and I agree with you that uh, uh, on the matter of the good the life, we have to recognize that there there is a wide range of preferences, tastes, and choices. However, we could uh, uh, we could say, and it seems that uh, uh, in part you say something like this, uh, like this that uh, some conditions, uh, um, some some scenarios are better than uh, than others. That some conditions uh, uh, promoted uh, through the the, the, um, the the use of new technologies increase the possibilities of having uh, a good life. Uh, and we could add uh, that uh, some conditions uh, increase the, possibility, the possibilities of choosing uh, your life. So um, it seems to me that uh, um, in your book and your presentation, there is 
a tension between uh, uh, a Nietzschean uh, perspective uh, and the attempt of defending uh, uh, a plurality, uh, a plurality uh, conception of good uh, with the idea that uh, uh, the new technologies are something something uh, something important for our life and for the life of our children something that we should uh, uh, employ deploy uh, uh, something that we should uh, use in order to um, to uh, to increase uh, the possibility uh, of uh, giving to the future generations a uh, good life so uh, my question is how you can uh, combine these two different uh, uh, ideas, the idea that technologies, uh, the technologies uh, are something good with the idea that uh, um, we should defend uh, a plurality uh, of concepts of uh, the goods. I guess um, the best way we can go ahead is, is having a directly a, com a conversation among, among us no? to, to, to have the response and the question on this issue. So um, one of the issues you raise, you seem to be, um, you, you seem to see a tension between the use of technologies and, and, and the sort of uh, um, which which according to your understanding, they always promote the same kind of goals. Technologies hint into, move into or promote one specific understanding of the good. And, um, and, and on the other hand, there is sort of the plurality of concept of the goodness. Is, is, is that, did I understand you correctly? That this is how, that technologies prefer one type of lifestyle because this is what they were made for. But on the other hand, humans have a great plurality of different lifestyles. This is true. Um, I mean, um, it seems to me that, uh, um, that you say that uh, um, the, the new technologies are important because they increase the possibility and the opportunity uh, of having uh, a good life. And uh, if, if, uh, uh, if we um, think about the reproductive uh, uh, scenarios, we have to uh, choose for our children. We have to choose, the maybe tomorrow with genome editing, we, uh, we will have the, 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 the opportunity to choose the genes of our children. And so it seems to me that uh, if we accept uh, that uh, technologies are a great opportunity, we should use genome editing in order to enhance the uh, natural uh, capacity of our children. But uh, um, this implies that uh, we should uh, be able to criticize and to blame some parents, for instance, uh, who give up uh, using uh, genome editing because they, for instance, think that we should, uh, um, uh, yeah, we, sh we should uh, respect the uh, natural process related to, to the birth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Um, so here we, we got the following issue. I think it, it, it applies to the, it, it's, it's quite structurally, that's another actually chapter of the book where I'm showing that genetic modifications by parents is actually structurally uh, analogous to the traditional type of educative uh, modifications. And we already have these issues when we deal with education. Um, and, and we can see that parents educating their children educate them in, in a great variety of different ways. Um, the one thing which, which you know, most parents regard as important and try to promote in some way, well, the children need to be healthy. Why? Because healthy health is, is something which most people, maybe, you know, most people identify with a better quality of life. 
So that's why health is such an important factor. And that's also why I stress, um, that's also why I regard the collection of digital and personalized data as, 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 as legally legitimate that it can be done in, in a liberal democratic uh, system. And so we've got health is extremely important. Otherwise, uh, well, many people might use it sort of promoting intelligence, promoting cognitive capacities, but there are others who think, no, it, it you know, um, actually intelligence is not so important. If you, if you look at sort of what people have been choosing, in, in the US there's, there's a sperm bank for Nobel Prize winners. Hardly anyone was interested in buying the sperm of a Nobel Prize winner. There was actually only one person who was born after having, you know, parents having, after, after, after a woman having used and having bought the sperm of a Nobel Prize winner. Why? Because the majority of people were more interested in having sporty, good-looking Ivy League students. So the combination, so sportiness or, or, or the looks um, seem to be quite an important important uh, or relevant uh, aspect which many seem to cherish on the other hand someone you know many parents then promote musicality which uh, musicality is again something something which um, which many people identify with a, with a good life so um, and here we already entered there's a great diversity of what what humans what parents regard as as increasing the likelihood of living good lives actually I think is the interventions which could be done by means of genetic modifications are even less less direct, less precise than the ones which are currently being done as part of the educative process. So currently, it's a case that you know um, you might you know someone might force the child or encourage the child to take violin lessons. But, but, you know, it's violin in the beginning is really terrible. You, you, if you hear it, it might, the entire family might suffer. And the child itself might suffer enormously. Um, so, um, but it, so parents force, encourage their children to, to go have music lessons. But um, if with genetic modifications, it wouldn't be so much that you can promote, um, at least initially, um, promote promote the capacity to the pl play the violin, but it might rather be a, a capacity like promote musicality in general. And musicality might be useful, might be connected with very different types of instruments which someone is capable of playing. Sort of the, the way parents, the, the, the parents can influence and, and direct and steer uh, the offspring, offspring's decisions might be even less, 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 specified than in the case of traditional education, than in the case of what parents are, are currently able to do. And it also needs to be, uh, needs to be kept in mind. I mean, the, the, um, that basically, you know, someone might be interested in, you know, it, it should be rather sporty and small person. Someone else, it's rather, um, you know, like a, a, a very, someone with a good, um, being able to capable of running uh, the marathon and being, being rather tall. And, and here the parental choices and preference are really very different and the great plurality. So I don't think that by using the gene technologies in this way, it does have to be the case that only, you know, only Superman or Viagra or Wonder Woman or Botox need to be realized. But what, you know, some, some capacities are being shared by more people like an increased health span and others um, might be more widely shared than others, but... But in general, you know, what parents have as an understanding of the good life, what they offer their children as part of the education process, what they try to give them a shape is, um, uh, or shape their, support their lives is, 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 is in a great multifaceted way. So I don't think technology necessarily imply a specific understanding of the good life, but the usage of the technologies can actually influence a great plurality of different, of different lifestyles. It just depends... Um, the decisive issue, and that's the one you're raising, the decisive issue is what are the limits what parents may decide for their children? Um, where, where, where does something like what is illegitimate as a type of parental education? And of course, we need to find, we need to have some limitations. And we already have these limitations, as in the case of traditional education, for example, it is, it is um, you know, once you have child abuse, then that's definitely an issue which needs to be legally sanctioned. So, so once uh, we have an issue which 
you know, where, where direct harm is being done as part of the intervention, then this is definitely definitely an alteration which need which must be forbidden. And um, so it's not so we can really start from the analogy between traditional traditional um, education and and genetic modifications by having standards for what is being regarded as legitimate and morally and legally legitimate or legally Ill illegitimate legitimate. and the further aspect obviously there is no clear cut answer to for for all the different societies we live in and in and, and, and it depends upon the society um sort of which and it depends upon the spirit of the times which which regulations are appropriate ones so i i wouldn't even want to give any type of general recommendation um where the boundaries are but it's clear that once abuse occurs then this needs to be a boundary once direct harm is being done to uh, to to offspring obviously that's a boundary so um um so we have a long tradition of regulations concerning educations and we can apply them in an analogous manner actually to the case of genetic modifications of parents on their offspring if I might uh, intervene. Um, from my point of view, if, uh, uh, if we think that uh, autonomy is important, uh, we should uh, uh, enhance uh, our, our children and the future generations because uh, uh, healthier um, people, uh, more intelligent people, um, can have more opportunity, uh, possibilities uh, of choosing uh, their, their life. Uh, and so it seems to me that uh, from your perspective, I understand your defense of uh, uh, moral pluralism, but at the same time, it seems to me that if we um, uh, recognize the value of uh, the new technology for uh, for the life for our life we should uh, recognize that uh, people uh, parents have a moral responsibility towards uh, their children and future generations to announce uh, their genetic and uh, genetic genetic uh, uh, traits and uh, in order to uh, um, to make them able to to choose uh, uh, the life that they will uh, will want. I mean that's that's a really important and tricky issue you're raising. So what about what about the case? Basically, we, by means of genetic modifications, we realize an interventions which guarantees or which increases the average life expectancy or which increases the average health span by thirty years. So in the average, people live, instead of 80 years, live 100, 110 years. Um, and we have, a, we have a way of dealing with it in a reliable manner. In a reliable manner also means, it also means the intervention must be such that, um, um, that no, no significant harm or no harm, no strong harm can occur in, 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 in the offspring. Um, what does it mean, no significant harm? So, well, if an intervention bears the risk of the child dying, then the harm is too great. Then simply we cannot, I mean, it, it you know, then, then the risk is such. So at first, you need to first establish genetic modification as a reliable procedure in order maybe even to offer it in the first place. Maybe at the beginning offering might be fine, but definitely not making it you know legally obligatory um because legally obligatory making a legal uh, making a, a procedure legally lo obligatory which could kill a person is, is is that is that is undermines the structures of a liberal democratic pluralistic society so it is important to render a procedure reliable and safe in order, in order to consider the option of, you know, turning them even into a, um, into a more uh, 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 connecting some stronger duties with it, but even in that case, I think negative freedom is such a wonderful achievement that um, 
that 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 there is no need to implement a legal obligation that parents use a specific even a genetic intervention in, in order to increase the uh, to increase the health span by 30 years because um because basically the advantages are, are enormous and will be realized by the people by the parents the people will realize though i mean the the if if someone lives 30 years long, longer in the average um um, people have much more possibilities for for flourishing, for experience, the beauty of life, the diversity of life, um, and and so there is a strong connection with improving the quality of life. So many people would be interested, and there is no need to introduce a legal obligation for doing so. Um, the the issue is, I think, a different one. The the issue is more different of of social justice. Um, what should we do? Uh, uh, what, what should we do in order to make it available? If we've got such a procedure, which is in the interest, which is in the interest of so many people, maybe in the interest of most people, um, shouldn't we then, not making it legally obligatory, but shouldn't we then guarantee that it's a procedure which can be financed by everyone? So everyone who wants to use the procedure within a nation state has got the possibility also of using this procedure. Parents shouldn't have to worry about the possibility of using a genetic modification procedure by means of which they can increase the health span by 30 years. And how could that be regulated? That could be regulated by means of a health insurance, by means of a public health insurance. So here, and, and we know CRISPR-Cas9 or genome editing is a relatively cheap procedure. You know, it costs like 30, 30 euros or something nowadays, maybe even less um, to, to realize such an intervention. So, um, so instead of making obligatory a procedure, which is, you know, widely, uh, where, where many people have an interest in using it anyway, um, it would rather be in order to guarantee social justice within a, within a society, we would have to render it, um, we would have to make it, we have to guarantee that it becomes a legal option, that it becomes a financial option for everyone to use that, to use that technology if they want to. That means, so if we have a, we, if we have a technology like genome editing, which uh, um, guarantees Um, uh, space, which would be in many people's interest, it would have to be guaranteed that this is a procedure, if it's reliable also, that can be covered or is being covered by a public health insurance. And so, and here again, the issue of the public health insurance arises. Health insurance are extremely costly. They need to be financed. If we undermine the possibility of collecting the data and using it for a great variety of purposes, we simply don't have the money to do so. And this is the risk which I see if, 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 date, if, if data collection or the collection of digital data is being made so difficult as this is being currently being done in, in Europe. In the end, the, you know, the, the, the situation will be such that, you know, in the private data, the, the personalized data will be collected in the, in the US by the big companies and they will be collected in a politically obligatory manner in, in China. The Chinese version is definitely the more efficient one because they can make it politically obligatory to collect all the different different ty types of data, which, which the liber libertarian American system could not guarantee. And in this way, they would have the means for innovation. And all the, they are, it's already the case that China has, has realized uh, more. They publish, China publishes more peer-reviewed articles than the United States. So China has already overtaken the United States in that respect. We don't even start talking about Europe or, you know, country Germany, Italy. We are already far behind. It's, it's, it's still a matter of how we can cope up with it anyway. So it's a matter of... Um, and so if, if this continues in the future, more and more money flows into the countries, you ask, but in particular China, which makes it which makes the quality, the econ economic quality um, in, in Europe drop even further. Ec less money will be available. If less money is available, less money goes to the public health insurance, less things we will be able to get covered in the public health insurance. Must, much more 
um, dissatisfaction occurs in, in, in Europe, scapegoats, minority groups, and so on. Um, tension in Europe leading to civil war. And because money is extremely, extremely important when taking care, just considering an issue of promoting promoting health, which most people share. And that's why I think we need to rethink. So stressing, stressing data protection is, is a, a, a terrible choice because it undermines our economic, but also in our interest concerning promoting the health span. And, um, and so we basically decided for regulations which undermines our most fundamental interest. And as a consequence, maybe the only way we can hope that Europe becomes a country like, you know, the new Switzerland, where all the rich people go and they pay sufficient amount of taxes because they cherish privacy. That might be a solution, but that's not going to be a realistic option. So we need to find an alternative. And the alternative is this democratic use of, of uh, collection of, of personalized data. And I don't see, I don't like, as I said in the presentation, I don't like it. I mean, in the sense, I really am afraid of the potential abuses connected to it. But I don't see any other pragmatic option of, of, of guaranteeing our economic, scientific, and, and, and also political flourishing here. Or am I wrong? No, I, I agree with you, and I agree with you that uh, um, the public health is a, a central issue in uh, every reflection on uh, new technologies. And uh, I would like to, to try to, to connect, uh, to relate the, the topic of public health with uh, uh, the concept of suffering in the chapter four of your book, you, you talk about suffering. Um, the, the chapter four of your book is, uh, is the best chapter of your book, in my opinion, because it is a, a, a great discussion of, of uh, uh, moral and philosophical uh, questions. And um, you, you discuss some, some um, uh, issues uh, uh, relevant uh, in the uh, discussion on transhumanism, virtual ethics, uh, um, the, the, the concept of uh, good life, uh, personhood, uh, uh, immortality, meaning of life, uh, utopia. And, uh, and you say suffering is something important. We should uh, uh, minimize uh, uh, the suffering in the world. And so my question is, if uh, uh, suffering is so important, uh, uh, it means that uh, we should uh, encourage uh, policy of public health able to minimize uh, the suffering in the, in the future. But uh, this implies that uh, uh, people should uh, uh, change, modify the behaviors and uh, try to, uh, um, yeah, to, to, to choose, uh, uh, for instance, uh, genome editing interventions or other, or, or choose other technologies able to uh, make future generation healthier. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it... I think that's extremely important sort of to move away from the traditional understanding what's the moral status of moral status of entities in the world well the moral status used to be connected in the highest moral status used to be held only by humans maybe angels and gods but primarily humans because we have the divine spark we are the ones who possess something special um, which makes us stand out so that has been the dominant view now for you know 2000 years as identified uh, with with you know personhood with who has dignity in the world and and sort of what i'm stressing there is is to show no the moral status should not be connected no longer be connected with with something like um, the divine spark which makes you know humans stand out alone um maybe angels maybe god 
but uh, we should we need to find a way of taking suffering seriously and taking it into into, into consideration and also implementing the legal implications and that means um that that suddenly you know there are nine non-human animals um who who can recognize themselves who pass the mirror test um like orangutans chimpanzees uh uh, there, 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 there are some elephants. There's a magpie. There are dolphins, um, and and that means, you know, we 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 would have to treat them in a significantly different way than 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 we used to in the past. You know, we would have to attribute to them personhood, something a higher moral status and higher recognition, and that leads to a lot of you know just the way we deal with factory farming. That's a nightmare. That has, has a lot of implications, um, um, but you know that takes a, a, it's 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 a revolutionary paradigm paradigm shift goes along with a move away from thinking about who who possesses a divine spark to the way we possess who 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 is capable of suffering. How can we identify the intensity of suffering? The um, who, the the intensity. How can we compare the suffering of 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 elephants and magpies? And, and adult humans and, and newborn humans and embryos and, 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 and fetuses. And we need to find a, maybe even a, a, an empirical way of dealing with, you know, to, to establishing the intensity of suffering. And that might provide us with a new fine way of establishing the moral status of, of the variety of entities. So that is just, I'm here hinting at the possibility, you know, of this, of this posthuman paradigm shift uh, in which we all live, and that means, but that means, and we, we, so far, there are still many people who live in the encrusted structures of the past who cherish them, and 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 it, and that means we also need to, to in a pluralistic liberal democratic society, it shouldn't be it shouldn't be governed governed neither by people with a dualistic binary mindset, nor with people with a monistic mindset. So that's why I said, no, we, we need to move away from that metaphysical, dogmatic, fundamentalist replies. We need to find, you know, way, move away from totalitarian understandings of, of foundations, essentialist understandings of the state. We need to find a more fluid way of thinking about these issues. And rather than thinking about ontological questions, we should focus on, you know, on, on the norms and the norms are fictions the norms we need to realize it's enormous enormously wonderful achievement that um, negative freedom has been established or that negative freedom has become a central norm in our in our you know liberal social democratic way of thinking but this norm is not something which is a new insight the norm is not valid for all times, for all in, in, in all parts of the world. And it's part of that paradigm shift that goes along. And this is probably, I think that's one of my, the most important insights which I'm trying to present, because I'm trying to present sort of a, um, a liberal ethics of fictive autonomy. It is, it is all the norms we have are in the end, they are fictions. Um, and fictions mean they lack any essentialist basis. They lack any ontological or metaphysical basis. But in the end, we realized they're human-made factors. And, 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 but negative freedom is a wonderful human-made factor. I cherish it enormously. And I'm happy that I'm living in the times in which many people regard negative freedom as a wonderful achievement. And 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 we need to and 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 it is this shift. It's so the norms and the legal norms, the the moral norms. We need to understand that they are no longer founded in something in in, in a metaphysical essentialist um, other Platonic realm um, with a necessary foundation, but they are founded. Um, they are founded in 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 a contract, in an agreement. What people regard as important. Um, what we regard as important, and so, and that actually leads me to a question um, which was raised in the chat section by by Nicholas. Um, so he said, "What relation should we have with governments and people that don't allow us to improve ourselves? 
I'm thinking of thinking in Chile politicians, wealthy people in the country as in by a conservative. Yeah. So what should we do? You know, if if these type of reflections, plurality are not are not being taken into consideration by the various politi by specific politicians, even politicians which have been voted for democratically. Well, in that case, we, we do need to do the same thing as what we can currently do. We need to be get active. We need to make sure that totalitarian structures in a, in a political systems get eradicated. We need to fight for plurality. We need to fight politically, be engaged in order to increase the plurality of possible lifestyles. And so it's not the problem. It's not the technology. The problem is are the political structures. And the appropriate political structures are, need to be such that we need to fight for them. And so it's the, the technologies are, they do change the way we interact with, the, uh, with, with, with our environment, but they are also a means to reach certain goals. And, and the, 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 the central issue is a political one. And for the political pluralities, it is something which we, which we need to fight for. And so um, there is no ready-made answer sort of to, you know, there can always be a conflict. There can be problematic people in, in the government. There can be problematic people in the European governments. And that's what I'm afraid for. If they have all the data that, that could take us into a situation of really of a totalitarian system of, on an unprecedented scale, which would be absolutely, it's terrifying. But the thing is, not collecting the data is not the better options because the data are being collected in, in other parts of the world. And that's why what I'm trying to present is sort of here an as good as it gets ethics. It's not a perfect solution, but that's why it's, it's, it's as good as it gets, no? And... Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Stephanie, if I can also ask something, uh, um, you know, also to, to Maurizio, to Stefan, both of you, I'm clearly not a philosopher, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm interesting in, uh, interested in uh, knowing more precisely about this, about the relationship uh, between these innovations, also this paradigm shift uh, that, that you are discussing, that you are, uh, you know, highlighting, right? The, the, the importance of which you are highlighting, uh, going against uh, uh, dualism, for, uh, for instance, a dualistic kind of view of life and so forth. So the relationship between this and politics, precisely. So how to translate this into political, into coherent political uh, measures, activities, I mean. So this may be not really easy. I mean, and probably, you know, some of these aspects were already touched upon by, by the former question. But uh, anyway, you know, this is uh, something that I would like to, uh, you know, to, to, to ask you. No, what wonderful a question. That's actually an extremely wonderful um, uh, and important question because we need to realize, and that's what I'm partly teaching in a, in a post-human studies course. That's what the post-human studies field is all about, is sort of the implications and, and, and the paternalistic structures which go, go along with, with, with dualisms, with, with, with categorical ontological dualities. And we need to realize that in, in the political situations, in various governments, actually in all parts of the world, it is still the case that the legal basis, that the constitutions are founded upon dualistic, categorically dualistic ontological structures. So um, personhood in most countries in the world is, is, is only being held or attributed to humans. Animals in the constitutions count as objects or are supposed to be treated like objects. And that shows, uh, that shows the, the strong dominance of categorically, ontologically dualistic thinking as it shows up in the political realm. And that is the result of a 2,000-year-old tradition, which 2,500-year-old tradition, which probably started... Or, or was strongly initialized by Plato's myth of air, you know, where we had the, this world and the material world and the immaterial world, which then was, was changed by Stoic thinking in the medieval times with Christianity being Platonism for the masses, with the Enlightenment and, and Kant still being a, basically a, a Christian thinker in affirming and having that ontological duality between the sensual world and the world of freedom as the very heart and foundation of, of of his philosophical approach. So that shows, you no, know, we, we, we really have a problem with these 
<coughs> with these dualities. And they are strongly encrusted structures as part of the political systems which they are in, which are still the dominant factors in all parts of the world. And they have rigid and they have decisive, they have decisive legal implications. Um, so just by starting with us, you know, only human beings possessing dignity, animals being things or animals being legally seen as things is is that is the widely shared attitude. There are only very few exceptions. I mean, one of the exceptions would be would be Austra uh, would be. Um, is Argentina. In Argentina, it was really recently claimed, it was le uh, the, the, the Constitutional Court uh, recently came to the decision that, that orang a specific orangutan should be treated like a person, is a person. As a consequence of that legal regulation, the orangutan had to be liberated from the zoo. And, 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 and that is a decisive step. And, and whenever such a court case came up in Europe, It came up in, 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 in Vienna, for example, in Austria. It was clearly said, no, a, 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 a great ape is not a person. And that usually came up when, it, when one dealt with sort of research, animal research, research on apes, how they were stored in, how they were kept in, 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 in zoos and so on. And so once we start rethinking this issue, that would have consequences on, on who to, do, to make research on. That would have consequences on how to deal with issues, people, you know, how to deal with animals in zoos. That would also have enormous significances on stem cell research, abortion issues, and so on. So it's 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 a, it's a you know fundamental paradigm shift, political paradigm shift, which which goes along with it. And but I don't think, and that's what I was trying to say earlier. The problem is if we then moved along, and that's that's sort of what I said as a response to Maurizio's question. So um, instead of starting with, with, a person, with an ethics of personhood, which starts, um, which starts with only, only humans as they possess a divine spark are persons towards an ethics, which, which assigns personhood on the basis on the capacity of, of suffering. Um, these, are two, these are two essentialist, fundamentalist, could be seen as two fundamentalist ways of dealing with the question. But then we would simply replace one essentialist system with a different essentialist system if they were taken as an, in an essentialist manner. But this is not what I'm presenting. I'm arguing in favor of a, of a system which takes suffering as its basis or the capacity of suffering as its basis. But I don't see it as an essentialist reply. That's not a, it's not epistemologically a better reply than the replies given it before. It's just a more, it's a plausible reply. It's something I'm suggesting. It's, it's, a, it's a proposal. It's a proposal which resonates with some, which doesn't re resonate with others. So I'm trying to, 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 to change the interpretation of how we see ourselves. And, and this, is, this is the difference. I'm, it's a way of moving away from essentialism because any kind of essentialism leads to violence because essentialism implies that it has got the right answer for everyone for all times in all parts of the world. And this undermines this radical plurality. This undermines the possibility of, of, of the great diversity of human flourishing, which is such a wonderful achievement. So, um, and, and that's what I've inherited from, you know, from one of my teachers, Gianni Vattimo, with his pensiero debole, with his weak thinking. It's actually the moving away from the sensualist answers, the moving towards a perspectivism. Um, that's not a, um, that weakening process is not a, is, is not a weakening in the sense of making things worse, but it's actually, it's, 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 it's an improvement, an improvement in, in reducing the violence being done to others. In, in, and by reducing the violence being done to others, you increase the possibility of, of, of the flourishing of the diversity of different lifestyles. And that's sort of why, you know, um, why, as you asked the political question, Fabrizio, that's why I said, no, we, we shouldn't have an essentialist answer. We need to have a fictive answer. But the fictive answer isn't supposed to meant to be a better epistemological reply. It's it's merely meant meant to stand for you know that's my suggestion, and I'm happy with people resonate with that suggestion. If people agree upon it, we come to a, to an agreement. 
and uh, that this is now a better way of dealing with it. That's the better way in the sense of we relate to it in a better way than, than we related to it in, in the past because it reduces the violence being done directly, be, being done to, to, to other persons, to other, to other entities. And so it's, it's the weak, the loss of God, the, the, the moving from essentialist to a non-duality, to a type of uh, to a fluidity, as a way of all the insights, all the norms, all the judgments we are making, they lost their essentialist foundations and they remain fictions. They human reign fictions. In the end, it's it's a, what I'm proposing. We should we should cherish and praise the beauty of fictions because as long as these fictions reduce the violence being done to others. And and that's what I'm advertising for. All I'm doing is a type of advertisement trying to to show the plurality of advantages which, which go along with this specific type of approach. It's not, it's not another fundamental answer which is supposed to provide the answer to all the problems we have. It's just a suggestion and I hope, and I hope you know, many people you know, resonate with this suggestion and then it leads to political implications. So it's a moving away from essentialism to its, to its embracement of the beauty of uh, fictive norms. Um, if, if this is making sense. Absolutely. I mean, totally. So it's really fascinating. I, 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 I really want to highlight this, how fascinating this is. Um, and, you know, in, in some of your, uh, in some of your, uh, uh, you know, what, what you were explaining, I mean, uh, in some of your, of, of your words, in some of the things that you are actually highlighting, uh, the suffering, the respect, diversity, and all that. I see, anyway, maybe I'm wrong, for sure, I'm wrong, but anyway, I see some, some sort of similarities with some of the speeches that sometimes Pope Francis does as well. I mean, so quite, quite, you know, uh, strikingly. I mean, it's not that what, what you say sometimes maybe, you know, goes also towards the direction of embracing, you know, uh some of the instances some of the ideas that are otherwise you know being developed by by those duelists also mm. i mean um in the sense yes no no you're raising a very important issue actually i'm currently writing the book on uh, philosophy of post human art where i deal a lot or finishing the manuscript where i deal quite a lot of us with possibilities of religiosity in the concept in the context of the post-human paradigm shift and um, yeah, there doesn't have to be a conflict between a Catholic approach and 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 such a, um, a, a non-dualistic approach. But the the challenge obviously is, and that is one specific tradition in the Catholic um, in the Catholic Church is connected to the to the Aristotelian natural law tradition, which goes along with very rigid conception. You know what is good, what is bad. Um, the moral status of entities in in how far the usage of 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 reproductive technologies should be granted or not so it is it it would be this approach of mine is is in conflict is definitely critical of of a natural law tradition catholic approach but there are other catholic approaches i mean i was referring to 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 Gianni Vattimo, uh, you know my teacher Gianni Vattimo's approach and he regards he regards himself as a catholic um and, and his weak thinking is is a, a Catholicism which takes him to church on Sundays for aesthetic reasons. Um, he doesn't see his Catholicism as as a um, epistemologically better justified basis, but it's, it's the, the the basis of his actions which resonate with him, which he in which the fiction in which he lives in in, in which um, um, he regards as possible and and uh, as plausible. Uh, for his own way of life, and and by taking so um, that has a lot of implications for how one should deal with the type of religiosity once one embraces that fictive understanding of norms, norms and and, on, and ontologies and so on. That also means that also means any kind of moral demand which implies, which implies which undermines the plurality of human flourishing would have to be prohibited. Any kind of moral demand which says, no, if you act like this, then you're ill. You shouldn't do so. 
then you know sort of the demands and here i'm not sure whether whether um um uh, the current Pope is actually, you know, so fully in tune with that. He might have many issues where, where it resonates with this kind of approach. But on the other hand, once he starts to, to homosexual relationships, there seems to have been an openness. But actually, when it comes to the issues directly, the implications, you know, he still sticks to the demands of the natural law tradition, which have been dominant in the Catholic Church for, you know, 2000 to, you know, for, 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 you know, a long period of time. And so here, um, the implications would definitely, for, for proper post-human religiosity, um, it, 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 the, the, his utterances in that respect still are too violent concerning the individual as in the sense as demanding of a specific lifestyle. But I'm not, as I said, I'm not saying that uh, Catholicism cannot be reconciled with the post-human paradigm shift. But the Catholicism would have to demand much more of an openness to the you know, great plurality of different lifestyles, would have to include much less harm directly being done to the individual. So, and that is what, that is what, 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 what Gianni Battimo argued. I mean, he says, the ethics of autonomy, if interpreted in the Catholic manner, um, actually, from his understanding, goes along with the preaching of, of, um, um, of, of Jesus Christ of the New Testament. Love and do what you will doesn't mean having a, implying a specific concept of love that only a, a, a heterosexual bond between a man and a woman and only they should only have sex once they have the possibility of having offspring is 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 being implied by a proper kind of love and that's that's the part of the uh, you know of the natural law tradition but it would have to mean as long as people get connected if they resonate with each other you know that's that can be as an appropriate christian type of love and it doesn't have to be as part of a you know as as part of a you know, traditional relationship or anything. It's just a matter of resonating between two and maybe even more than two entities, three, four, five. And that's what this openness to it, um, you know, reducing the harm being done directly to another, to, to another person, to another entity implies. And, and it's, it's, it's sort of the avoidance and moving away from totalitarian answers, from universal answers, from essentialist answers, from anthropocentric answers, from logocentric answers, um, towards a way of more respect towards the others and reduction of violence being done to them. But um, there doesn't have, as I said, there doesn't have to be a conflict with a religious approach. Um, but in, given many religious approaches, maybe less so in Buddhism, but in many of them, you know, um, the examples, the example you mentioned, there might the de demands might still be too strong, um, and a bit of further weakening process I think would be needed in order to to embrace a proper to to identify a proper post-human uh, religiosity with the current pope. You know? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree totally. But you know what you say, it's 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 convincing. Uh, and I agree with you that it takes time anyway, but it's important to, to start discussing about this, to, you know, start um, creating the, the, the issue, the topic. So that's precisely mm -hmm. what, what you're doing. So thank you. And maybe, maybe there's just one question which came up uh, earlier by um, here. Um, the statement, the truly democratic way of life is complicated when neoliberalism is rampant and cuts across our society. And, and I think that's that's a very very important question, but that's exactly part part of what I was trying to um, trying to say. Is that sort of the way we deal with demo with digital data, or what I try to show here in the presentation. Um, if it's being collected by Facebook and Google, if it's being collected by the big tech co tech company uh, tech companies, um, and, and this is exactly. This is this is goes along with the type of libertarian capitalism and these data being stored, the data being accessed by the members, by the people, employees of the company. Who knows who accesses which data and uses it for which 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 purpose? Who knows, you know, if the data being collected being by the leaders, with the, by the directors of these companies, are not using them, you know, in order to gain political influence? And that's why I'm saying no. I mean. 
I know humans are always corruptible. It's it's humans. They are humans are always abusing their power, and that's why any information humans have could always be used against others. It, there's a, there's always the risk of this happening. Um, however, however, you know, if if I had to choose, and mo ma most people don't seem to worry. You know, they give it. They have their smartphones next to the bed. Whatever happens, you know, you know, any any any. Anyone can download something from the internet and, and turn turn your smartphone into a spying device. You know, it is it is the the information could be out there, could be made widely accessible. What we what we share with these with our smartphones and everyone's using them. Uh, um, no one's afraid um, of of like the tech 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 companies or the people employed there. Uh, you know, using that information against against the individual. We all share. It's all goodies. We get, share. We receive all the. You know, we can use Google and Facebook freely and Instagram or whatever. Um, and, and and but it actually we're paying. You know, we're paying with the data. Not only we're with the product. Um, and so I'm. I I, I try to avoid um, giving away this my own digital data. But but only in the current situation, in the situation in which we currently live, um, because it's not in our interest. Because it's in the interest of the companies who co collect the information, and um, and it, it, they are using it in order to, to for their own financial flourishing, for their own financial well-being, in order to 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 for them to get richer. Um, and, but instead, I want a democratic use of digital data, which means. Which means that the that the money gets used in our interest, and what is our interest? And that's what I'm trying. I was trying to say, yeah, the money, the money, um, the the data, the personalized data, digital data needs to get used in order to pay for public health insurance because that's what most of us us wants. I'm not even saying everyone wants that, but most people see an increased health span with a with a better quality of life, and that's why it's so important. Um, that this will be taken care of and paid for, um, will be paid for um, by means of of the of the collected data. And and it, I know it's a, it's a radical paradigm shift, but I, I don't see any other way of realizing that that um, and definitely not collecting the data is not a, a, a better. It's just not a pragmatically more more convincing and plausible option. And so so far, even though I'm scared. Of the data being collected, um, I it's it's an as good as it gets solution. I don't have a better answer to quest to give, and I would be help, helpful and happy if someone was able to, you know, show me a different option. But unfortunately, this is the case. But hopefully, as part of the further discussions on on the book and the further exchanges, um, yeah, we will we will find a more refined, a better way. Um, to to um, of dealing with the digital data. So far, I think it needs to be collected and needs to be used in a democratic manner. So, if I have time, I have a, a last question. Yes. Um, um, you, you, there are some some pages of your book on on uh, on Nietzsche. Hmm? Uh, you talk about about Nietzsche in uh, beautiful pages uh, worth reading, uh, and uh, and and you defend the virtuatic perspective uh, of Nietzsche uh, against uh, uh, Michael Sandel. You say that. Uh, um, and conditional love uh, is an important virtue that it, 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 um, is not enough, hmm? and uh, um, that we can find in the Nietzschean uh, pages uh, um, some uh, good suggestion in order to uh, encourage other other virtues such uh, uh, as uh, truthfulness and uh, nobility. I would like that uh, that um, you talk uh, uh, um, about this uh, um, truthfulness uh, virtue. Can you explain better what it is? And uh, uh, because it seems to me that uh, um, uh, 
truthfulness implies uh, uh, the idea that uh, um, that we are very clear to ourselves, and so we can express ourselves because we know ourselves what we want, what we um, intend uh, to to reach, and. Uh, it seems, it seems to me that this idea of a subject is in contradiction with the modern idea of, uh, of uh, the, the, the self. Wonderful question. Yeah, no, that's an extremely, extremely uh, important question. Um, and um, in the sense of, you're right, um, sort of that issue of truthfulness um, it, 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 if, if taken in the, in the traditional sense, it seems to imply as if, if there was like an, there is like the core self, the authentic essentialist core self, which can be, which can be unfolded, which can be discovered and which can be realized. And, um, and in, in specific passages in which I write about, um, um, I, in the book, I also explain that this is not the case and why this is not the case. And what truthfulness, uh, what truthfulness implies, and why it is such a, and and, and the issue you mentioned is exactly um, the challenging one when we deal with truthfulness. So one issue, I think there are. So in the end, this understanding of the of the of the self is is a fluid one. It's not a it's it's a bundle self. It's not an essentialist self. It's a self of tribes. Um, but tribes interacting with other tribes, and 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 so there's not like the tribe, not even the tribe in itself, which could be understood as an essentialist tribe. Um, however, there are some which are more more core than others. There are some, for example, and 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 here I want to say there are some which are mo more closely connected to one's to one's own fictive self understanding than others. In the sense of, well, um, many of the tribes come about as as higher order tribes, as second order tribes. In the sense, you know, we get confronted with ideals in public media. This is how you should be. This is our ideal of beauty. This is our ideal. What looks cool nowadays. And then, because many people share that, because many people uphold that. Because many people say, no, if you get a job offer which gives you more money, more prestige, you should take this. The one, it is one, one, one says this is what you should do. You should subscribe to the Instagram ideal of beauty. You should ascribe to making more money. You should ascribe to getting the more prestigious job. job. This is what one should do. And here I'm saying, no, it's it's this is part of the social social media. This is part of the uh, um, tribes which install a higher order, higher order, tri higher order tribes in us, but they are not not so closely connected to the more core tribes. Um, without the core tribes being essentialist tribes, but um, but these tribes can be incorporated in our own being in the world, in our own becoming in the world, and in this way of integrating in, into us. It, it, is, it can be extremely difficult, actually, to distinguish the ones which have been created by social media um, with the ones which are much more intimately connected to what we desire, to what we want, to what we strive for. And, and the challenging issue is to, to distinguish these created higher order tribes which, which, which have been which have been installed in us, integrated in us, from the ones which are more core to our beings. And, and because there's an interconnection, our tribes also get altered. So it is extremely difficult to make that distinction because, because also of, of the loss of an essentialist core of who we are. Because of us, but because of us as, as, as being a bundle of tribes which already get connected. Um, and so... The truthfulness idea is is some is is somehow connection to to whatever is more more central to some core idea of what is more closely, more intimately, more long permanently connected to what we cherish, to what we long for, um, 
and 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 we need to separate us you know with the things which slowly come which one has integrated in us which one has upgraded us with which we don't which which is not so intimately connected to what we desire and long for and and so and and and, and sometimes these things even get interwoven and altered that makes things even more 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 difficult so here some more changes need to occur and so the truthfulness idea is is the one is is a, is a, is it's like a mindfulness meditation is is something mm. you you analyze yourself you analyze but not yourself in an essentialist unchanging self but you analyze your interactions with your environments you analyze yourself as a bundle of tries and how they've been altered in the history and therefore you 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 need to separate more intimate tries with less intimate tries with 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 the ones which the one demands among us which which are less strongly connected to what makes us flourish what makes us good feel good and happy about ourselves and and so here the truthfulness is 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 sort of an intimate mindfulness analysis of how of the coming about of our tribes and the altering of our tribes and 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 what we need to get rid of what we need to separate us from what we need to cherish further and that is an extremely difficult and complex procedure and but 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 um yeah but one which i think for me is sort of the, the central core of increasing the likelihood of you know of us flourishing of our our tribes unfolding in the most 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 passionate and the strongest way and 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 therefore we need to stop the tribes which hinder us which 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 stop us from of a, a, a more free unfolding process um and 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 here you know like a mind some kind of mindfulness meditations can be extremely helpful in order to realize um um some some also other religious procedures can be helpful in in making us making us aware of you know what is intimately connected to who we want to be what's the core bundle of tries we cherish and who we want to be in the world and truthfulness is is here is is not something it doesn't mean and that was the criticism of michael sandel um it doesn't always mean um, you know it's it's only parents you know unconditional love um which is being demanded as a parental virtue but truthfulness can only mean no there can be something no we want also to our own um something to to, to being superior the tribe of power the tribe of you know domination can be something which is quite strong in us and it's not just sort of that ideal of loving the other uh, in unconditional manner which is the you know, truthfulness goes beyond that there are other tribes there not only the tribe to unity with others but actually and that might they might be at least as strong the tribe to us to its to to its singularity a tribe it's to its being special tribe tribe to its a type of domination and that's i think extremely also important to acknowledge this um and to 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 dare to acknowledge this um and and they these tribes can be undermined in specific circumstances so i'm extremely grateful for asking me that question because um it's one of the most challenging issues we're 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 all confronted with i guess in separating our, our the bundle of our core bundle of tribes with the ones which what we are told to do from others which we should cherish no i guess no wonderful Wow, this is so fascinating, uh, guys. Really, so this is uh, now going. No, thanks to to the uh, to the really important, beautiful question of Maurizio, and to the you know great answer of Stefan. This is going from philosophy towards uh, maybe something else, psychology, maybe. No, mm. so how to be true to oneself? How to be yourself? I mean, how to become yourself? This is what we always, I mean, try also to. You know, in a way to 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 teach. I mean, to to you know to say to the students as well. I mean, right. So there is you know so much to say also from the point of view of education, of course. Exactly. Of Maybe we come. We have one last question, and then we can. It's been a long exchange. We have one last question from Prunella. Um, 
who wonders, Prunella Antumarini, Professor Antumarini, who's asking, isn't, isn't the vision I'm presenting, isn't, isn't it a utopia as well? And actually, I'm, I'm strongly stressing in the, in, the, in the book that I'm presenting a non-utopian version of transhumanism. Um, and it is, it is important for me, actually, because utopias are extremely dangerous. And that's why I want to that's why I want to want to want to answer that question because um, no, it's 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 very important that this is not a utopia, utopia. which 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 I am presenting, um, because it is it is not a utopia because I'm not aiming at a perfect final situation. I'm not aiming at a perfect state where with all the answers, with a reply to all the questions, um, any perfect political arrangement, social arrangement. Um, where everyone lives in harmony. But, but I'm merely presenting a couple of guidelines, a couple of outlines, a couple of suggestions, um, which are supposed to help us this unfolding of a great plurality of different lifestyles, which is supposed to guarantee the, you know, the, 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 to undermine the violence being done to the others. Um, so I don't, I, it's, it's, I don't have a perfect state in the future and we need to sacrifice everything in the present to achieve that further state. That would be in a utopia. And these types of utopias are extremely dangerous because you sacrifice the present for a future which will never, which will never be the case, which will never be there. Um, and that's why you sacrifice all the good lives of the people in the present. And... And, and therefore, I strongly reject. It's a vision, yes, but it's not a utopia because I only present, it's a fiction. I only present suggestions. And I, I'm not presenting essentialist final answers which have to be taken into consideration. I'm presenting suggestion in order to, to enter into a dialogue with the others and to find a better way of, you know, of, of uh, uh, arranging, of structuring our society. It's merely a suggestion. Um, um, and 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 I and and here, yeah, directly, um, Prunella sort of replies that yeah, she agrees, but the gap between the actual situation and the ought to be vision sounds like it. Yes, unfortunately, I agree with you too. Um, I agree with you too because, uh, um, yes, the gap between sort of the situation in which we currently live in, um. Um, is, 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 is much more, in China, it is much more authoritarian, totalitarian. In, in, in the US, it is much more libertarian. And in none of the ways, sort of the, the great plurality of different flourishing is, is being realized in a proper democratic manner, in particular when it comes to the collection of digital data. Yes, the gap between, between you know, what I've been presenting and the current social organization and political organizations are enormous. And but but all I want to do is basically is, is sort of putting giving an initial in, in, in initialization initial drive an emotion sending out some effects in order to rethink the meaning of digital data, and I think we really need to do so. We need need to take take seriously the importance of digital data, of personalized digital data, and sort of the solution of rejecting it by referring to privacy rights as we do, we have done in, 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 in Europe so far is, is, is not in our interest. And that's what, what I, mean. I I care too much, both for Europe as well uh, for, for the unfolding of the great plurality of, of types of flourishing in, all around the world um, in order, to, not, in order to, to stay calm and not to present that voice. So it's merely an initial stimulus in making people rethink the meaning of digital data. And I hope we'll be, be able to do so much more in, in further exchange and in further conferences, no? So it's been great having these intense exchanges and intellectual reflections, philosophical thoughts, cultural reflections with all of you. Many, many thanks. So I guess, yeah, we hopefully be able to meet up in person again soon yeah. next year and then to discuss these issues further. So... Thanks. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. It was really a great, great pleasure. And thank you very much for the discussion, uh, Stefan. Thank you, Fabrizio. For Many thanks, for Fabrizio, for, for, for asking, for moderating, and Maurizio for being such a wonderful discussion. <laughs> so we can end the progress now. Thank so you. Have a wonderful thank evening. You.
<laughs> bye bye. Bye. Thanks. Looking forward to hearing further responses. <laughs>